Welcome, thank you, I'm so happy you're here. And I'm also testing my mic and saying hi at the same time. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Again, I'm Carrie Rigo, I'm from Sonoma State University. I also teach at Santa Rosa Junior College. I've also th written three dead tree books about social media, otherwise known as paper. Um, do I have a clicker, possibly? Oh, there's a clicker. Fantastic, fantastic. That's a, you know, that's an author joke. Um, Okie dokie. So each one of you in here, I really, really enjoyed listening to Sabrina. Where'd Sabrina go? Oh, hi, good. I could hear you, but I couldn't see you. So it's nice to see your face. Um, listening to the story of your town and listening to um, you telling your vision, your passion, where you started, where you're going, what you want, um, what you see for your community. That's all a story. And each one of you has the opportunity to tell a story about who you are, where you're going, what your community is like, particularly to show people that might be convinced that this isn't the place to be if they're younger or if they're looking for something particular, but ultimately seeing the beauty of where you are and seeing the people and seeing the skills that your makers, your people, your artists, and your community members have, that story needs to be told. And if you don't tell it, Someone else will fill in the gap with whatever they think is true. And if anybody's ever told a story about you and you didn't know them, the odds are the story's not accurate. Um, so each one of us has the opportunity. In fact, human nature, um, we didn't write and we didn't read. We spoke to each other. Our history was oral. We still have that ability. We still have that flexibility. We do need to practice it. Uh, there is an old adage. Don't toot your own horn. Anybody else hear that at home? I heard that one at home. Well, at this point, we have to recognize that we don't have our own crew of cheerleaders that follow us around. And um, some industries call it the hype man. <laughs> if you are on stage, a singer or a rapper, they call a hype man or a, um, a comedian, the person that introduces and brings them out. Um, you don't have one of those, probably. If you do, Come find me afterwards. I want to know where you found your hype man. Um, but you have to do it for yourself. And there are a lot of tools that you can use. I'm sure you've seen a social media presentation before. I'm going to present to you today um, in two different perspectives. Offense and defense. And these sets of tools can be called branding or reputation management, depending on what side of that line you're on. Um, reputation management is one step away from crisis management. I don't ever want to hear a phone call from a client that says, we have a, um, a huge problem on our hands. And I won't even begin to quote some of the really terrible stories I've heard. One time it was so bad, I said, ooh, I'm on vacation. I'm really sorry. I was. I was in the Grand Canyon with no reception, like no internet. But I did have to say, I, I can't, I'm, <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry. Even if I wanted to, I can't help you. Put down the phone and I went, Whew. So <laughs> let's start with offense. And then if necessary, we move to defense. But if you start in this order, then you don't get to crisis management because that's not a fun place to be. All right. So your brand is what is made up of a whole combination of items, including your image. This might be your face, which if you're like me and your brand is named after you, my business is called Carrie Rigo Consulting. There is no hiding who represents my business. And I don't get a day off from that. Uh, so my face is actually my best logo. Yours might be as well. You might have a logo like I do, uh, but people know my face first. And they in fact know something else that you're staring at, but you probably don't notice. I have something called a carry dress. That's what my girlfriends call it. Um, they'll send me a photo of a dress and they'll be like, oh my God, that's a carry dress. When I'm at home, I wear superhero t-shirts and sneakers and stuff like that, right? I work in tech. Ultimately, I wear t-shirts all day but I also know how powerful an image is. So your image is your face, it's your logo, it's your colors, it's your fonts, it's the way your image is presented in public. Whatever makes that up. Is, are socks your thing? Red. Red. Okay, all right, okay, all right, all right. So we knew it. You'll never see me in the show. Recognizable. We've met before. Yes, we have. Okay, good, but the socks really caught my attention. <laughs> He's got these great um, Christmas like candy cane socks on. So every single one of us has something about us that's us. So lean into it. 
acknowledge that, work with it in whatever way that you can. And I have a whole closet of dresses that are shaped just like this, just different colors. Um, what's your mission? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? I'll tell you mine. I hope you know yours memorized now, Pat. I help people and technology together change the world. Your local world, your very small world, or the big one, I'll take any version. Um, but what is it that gets you out of bed? What is it that you do? This is the thing that helps me decide who to shop with, who to spend time with. When I go to that dollar store, that general store, I'm not going because I'm gonna save 42 cents. I'm going because I really need to talk to somebody and you're really friendly. I'm going because you, somebody here supports the local softball team, right? Somebody buys out the brownies every year when they're in front of the grocery store or just calls up the mom and just buys them. You can put me on your Christmas list. <laughs> but you have a mission, you have a differentiation, you have a vision for what you want your world or community or industry to look like. Tell us what that is because that helps me make a purchasing decision, that helps me support you, that helps me go out of my way to support you because our mission, our visions, our values are very similar. So yes, it's what you look like, but it's all of the pieces and parts that encompass that. So there is a very shallow perspective of your logo, your colors, your website, um, but there's more to it. And this is all part of your story. So think about it. Think about, and if you have to start with what's on your website, that's a great <laughs> first draft. Um, and you can make it even better. Your uh, about us. I challenge you, if you have a website, to put on your about us your actual photo. <laughs> because that's the first thing I look for. Who is that person? And when there's no photo, I physically go, hmm. Alrighty. So here are the steps with offense in branding. When it comes to social media, your brother-in-law will tell you at Christmas this year that, oh, are you on Twitter? You're not on Twitter? Oh my gosh, you should totally be on Twitter. And then you think, oh man, should I be on Twitter? No, no you shouldn't. Not even close. All right, Northern California users don't like Twitter. They don't use it. In fact, the US only goes up to about 24% usage of Twitter. Your favorite journalist uses it because they have to for their job. Your favorite athlete uses it because they sort of use it for their job. <laughs> but the average Northern American, or uh, North Californian does not, and I said that like I don't live here. Um, Northern California, depending on what county you're in, it doesn't matter, we're all pretty much the same. Once you leave San Francisco, above that, people don't care. Um, so when your brother-in-law or cousin corners you at Christmas, because it happens every year, um, and then you think you need to use that channel, it's more important about where are your people, the people that buy your products, the people that do your thing, um, the people that are interested in you, understanding where they are is really, really important. Age range, um, location, physical location, um, that might be gender, gender expression, that's something else we have to think about because we're not working with a binary anymore. Um, we're working with a lot of options and a lot of different kinds of people and sensitivity really matters. Um, we also have ethnicity, we have cultural experience, we have language. Those are all the things that you want to take into account when you're thinking about who buys your product or service, who is interested in what you're doing, um, who needs your services. What room are they in? I use a service called Pew Internet, pewinternet.org, P-E-W. It is a think tank, nonprofit, and it's sole purpose is to poll and survey people. So it's the number one go-to resource for demographics for US internet users. Now Pew's search function isn't all that great, so I'll ask Google to do the heavy lifting for me. And I'll say internet users, 18 to 25, Caucasian, or African American, or Latina, doesn't matter what I'm looking for, but I'll ask for a specific um, type of demographic, and then I'll stick Pew, P-E-W, into the search and then it will dig up and find me a report that is highly cited and highly sourced in every major publication that I follow. Pew is one of two resources that comes up again and again. So I figured I'd give it to you directly, figure out who your people are, and then ask Pew to tell you what digital room they're in. And it, they update about once a quarter every six months, but it's um, a huge part of the data that I work with on a daily basis. What room are they in? Um, you do not have to use all of the tools. I would rather you use one really well 
than all of them fairly poorly, sadly. Uh, you might have a channel that you were really excited about and you're like, man, this YouTube machine is the best. From 2014, you have a video that says, I'm gonna shoot a video every week. <laughs> That's bad. So a deleted or a, um, an abandoned channel, please don't just leave it hanging out there. What it says to your audience, what it says to a potential, cust potential customer is that you don't clean up after yourself that you leave loose ends, that you don't care so much. I have a friend that can't spell for a darn, and every single time I see a marketing email go out with misspellings and missing grammar, missing grammar and punctuation, I wonder what else that person is forgetting or that they don't think is important enough. So, do one well, <laughs> then move to two. You do not need to cover them all. It's unnecessary. And in fact, you probably don't have enough time in your day to cover them all, right? Okay. So then, so I've given you, yes, don't use all of them and don't let somebody bully you into using a channel. If you know who your audience is and then you have Pew as a backup, Pew will tell you where your people are. So when you get cornered and somebody says you should use Twitter, you'll have a response that sounds something like, my audience is actually on Facebook. And they'll say, really? oh, that's not right. And you'll say, well, that's what my data shows, and that's what my data resource shows. They'll have nothing. Data solves most problems. <laughs> OK. So the right channels. Visual consistency is really important. This image is not mine. I don't own it. I actually don't even remember what I looked up. I probably looked up blue palette, something of that nature, in Google to see what showed up. It's almost exactly the palette of colors that I use. So of course, I used it for the presentation because I liked it. I was drawn to it. You have colors that you use. They're in your logo. They're in your dress. They're in whatever it is that is special to you. So if you already have a logo and you already have branding, make sure you have your color code. Sometimes they're called hex codes. They're color model identifiers so that you can give it to a printer or a website developer so that everything matches. I don't know about you, I have um, two screens. Um, one of the screens was given to me, so it's, kinda, it's not very advanced, it's not very fancy, it's not highly tech um, savvy either, it's kind of old. But my two different screens, everything looks different. You can't eyeball color, not on the internet, because every machine you line up next to each other, they're all gonna be different colors. So make sure you know what your codes are. Um, your um, hex colors, your RGB codes, CMYK if necessary. Ask your graphic designer. If you have one, oh, sorry. Oh, and if you're interested, you can grab my card after and I can send you a few resources. Uh, um, oh, by the way, this slide deck is available. There is a link at the very end that you can write down and you can download a PDF of this. Your logos, when you look at your website, when you look at your Facebook or any other channel that you're using, is it highly pixelated? Does it fit into the space? Do you even like it? Um, so it used to be our graphic designers would develop designs that would fit across the top of a page, a header for letterhead. Those logos, if you still have one that's shaped like that, won't work anymore. So you have to think about a logo that's a square that will fit into your profile photo that is recognizable without being able to open it. Does anybody in here have an Instagram account? So Instagram, you've noticed this, if you touch the profile photo because you want to see who's in the photo, you can't. It doesn't get any bigger and you feel blind. So if I can't recognize that photo without expanding it, then the image doesn't work. Ask your graphic designer, if you have one, if you need a referral, ask somebody in your community with great artwork or a great business and ask them who they use and see if you can use a local designer. Local graphic designers are fantastic. Of course you can find one overseas, uh, but try local first. Um, a great graphic designer, if you ask them, will give you your color codes. They'll give you a transparent version of your logo. They'll give you maybe a black and white version, a PDF. Uh, they'll give you the Photoshop file, a JPEG, a ping, whatever you need. They just zip them on over to you. Uh, so make sure that the logo representation that you have for your business is something that you're proud of. That's something that shows you in your best light. This is something really small, yet it has a really large impact when I go to your Facebook page and there's one photo and it doesn't fit the space. And I can't read it and I can't recognize you. Okay. If you use particular filters, some environments like Instagram have filters built in, but if you are really fancy and you know Photoshop, I'm taking an online JC class learning Photoshop, 
Whew, that's hard. It's a lot. It's been a while since I've taken a technical program and it's nice to feel like I don't know something. That's great. Keeps me humble. But it's hard. So if you have a filter or a theme or presets that you like, think about how your images can be canned and templated for the future. You might have this already in regular documentation. Just think potentially digitally how you can save time and be more efficient in your representation. Um, your profile and cover images. By the way, if you're using Facebook, open up your profile or your cover, Im cover image and I bet that you don't have a caption. You can hit edit and write a caption for your profile or cover image. Tell a story. Tell me why you chose that photo. Send me to your website. Tag the location of your business. Tag the photographer. Uh, mine have not only the photographer, but when they're really good photos, a makeup artist or the videographer. Um, tell other people who you're working with. But the most important part is tell me the story of why you chose that photo or, or what's happening or where you want me to go. Don't, use, don't lose the opportunity that the keywords and those descriptions that they do for you. By the way, Facebook is a social search engine. And search engines need words to tell them what's important. So make sure that you put descriptive words into your captions, your photos, your posts, your website so that search engines that have no eyeballs, they can't go off your photos. They need words. So use those captions to your best advantage. I'm gonna hit this little arrow guy, how about that? You have a voice, you have a tone of voice. Now each channel that you have might have a slightly different voice. On Twitter, I'm really geeky. On Instagram, I'm really personal. On Facebook, I'm really conversational. On YouTube, I am standing on a stage giving a speech, very educational. Slightly different approach in different locations. Now you don't have to use all of those channels, but think about who you're talking to and where you're talking to them. I have something I call the barbecue test. This is when I go to a family barbecue or a you know, baby shower, Thanksgiving, doesn't matter, and I'm sitting next to my Aunt Penelope and I only see her once a year. And she's being nice and she's got a glass of lemonade and she says, so how's work? Tell me, what is it that you do? And I know she doesn't really care. So am I going to give her the highly technical version? No, I'm going to give her the version that makes sense to anybody that asks that question. This is the barbecue test. Everything that you talk about in your industry, particularly on social media, has to pass the barbecue test. I can't see your face. I can't read your body language. So here's my trick. Write the post. Read it out loud. Does that sound like your voice? I don't use contractions when I write. Do not, shall not, will not. Sounds very serious. I read it out loud and then I realize that doesn't sound like me. Read it out loud. It'll help you get a conversational tone of voice. Think about the tone on each channel that you're using. How do you want people to feel? How do you want it to sound? Beep. -y. <laughs> you can have it sound like anything you want. The language that you're using. Is it lay person language for the average person? Yes, possibly. Is it highly technical for your colleagues because you're establishing that you know what you're talking about? You can have both and you can have everything in between, but you have to think about it a little bit ahead of time. What is the purpose of the channel? You are using Facebook for what? Are you trying to drive traffic? Are you traffic to sell products and make money? Yes, I hope that's a yes. Um, it isn't just about being liked or being popular or being special. Those are fantastic and wonderful, but your real relationships, your family and friend relationships are going to do a much better job of that. Um, by the way, you can buy followers and you can buy likes for pennies. So likes, um, that is what we call a vanity metric. It makes us feel good, but it doesn't actually mean anything. So you're wanting to drive traffic to your shopping cart, to your event, Come on in, tell us a fancy code word and we'll give you a free cup of hot chocolate. But what is the purpose of the channel? Why are you really using it? And keep that in mind when you use it. It's very easy to get distracted by shiny lights and fun tools that don't actually do anything productive for your business. Your human and authentic voice really boils down to what I mentioned with the barbecue test. Do you sound like a real person? 
that has a that has a really big impact that people sound like something that they're comfortable with when I hear it in my head when I read your post so think again about the channels that you're using and what's different about them if I follow you on four social media channels and the posts are identical the tone is identical they come out all at the same time I do not need to follow you in four places. In fact, I will probably be irritated because you've wasted my time. The one thing I can't get back, the one thing I can't pay for. So when you're asking people to engage with your social media content, you are asking them to give you their time, the most precious thing that they have. So it has to be worth their time. And you have to think very clearly about why you're doing what you're doing. Otherwise, you're wasting everybody's time. Algorithms love consistency. Algorithms like consistency, and all of the things that they like are largely based on what humans like. Just like when you go to Google, an information search engine, and you look up information, you click on things, Google says, oh, you liked that link. I'm going to give you more of stuff like that. So every time you search a topic, your view gets more and more narrow because it's more and more customized to who you are. Social search engines are exactly the same way. So you get more and more of what you like. Now, the funny thing is, is that humans like consistency. We like things on a 30-day cycle for a variety of reasons. Um, we like things on 24-hour cycles. We also like things at the same time, dependably, every week. It lends to trust. If you say on Saturday night that you're going to do a live television show that's funny every Saturday night, I'll watch it. You might have watched that show. Saturday Night Live. Live television, live broadcasting also has an element of danger. Somebody could swear, they could fall, they could embarrass themselves. They might not be perfect, they might be real. Um, so live television and live streaming are really popular for that reason, but it's really important that you have consistency. Facebook likes three posts a week. Instagram likes 1.5 posts a day, which I just shoot for once a day. Twitter is multiple times a day. Blogging, once a week. They all have natural rhythms. Um, so whatever the rhythm that you choose on whatever channel you're on, you can always look up how many times should I post on Instagram. 2019. Put the date in, because you might get a really old answer. <laughs> um, how, how frequently should I post? Or what's the best practice? Any general question, and you'll get the information. Um, but when you pick that consistency, stick with it. Find the right frequency for the channel you're on. Stay consistent. The algorithms will reward you by showing you more frequently, because you're dependable, you're reliable, you've thought about what you're doing, you have consistent content. It's all the things that the users like. They don't trust you if they can never depend on when you're going to show up. That translates to dollars. My chiropractor, I love him. I went to high school with him. He's fantastic. I feel like he takes really great care of me. But I can't rely that he's ever open. He's a, he goes to Sacramento and he lobbies for chiropractic care and he's, he's, a, he's an activist. I get it. I'm really happy about that. But I realize that I roll past his office like this. The other thing with the PSPS, not knowing what was going to be open. That was a weird experience. So showing up when you say you're going to show up and being there when people show up for you, that's a big deal. So Sabrina, you mentioned about being fractured. And I thought that was a really interesting point because I hear consistently that we, what we see online is, um, not a, an accurate representation of who we are and it's pulling us apart and I, I definitely agree with some of that. What's interesting is that we choose the things that we want to show. So it's definitely not complete and it's not whole. But what happens is, the cool part is, kind of like each time we've experienced a fire or some other disaster, something terrible happens but something amazing happens right after it. We realize how much we care about each other. And we get really good at taking care of each other I don't know about you, but I'm, um, I live in downtown Santa Rosa, but the sense of pride in my community, in your community, when I saw us show up for each other, apparently the firefighters say, California is pretty special like that, that they don't see the way we behave anywhere else. 
So something terrible might happen, but ultimately, we're finding fantastic ways to support each other and be there for each other. And this is a big one, whether you're online or you're in a real-time relationship. Show up for people. Be there when they need you. Be there just reliably. And that builds a lot of trust that you can't buy in a Facebook ad. That consistency. Here's the trick for social media professionals. We use theme days. Has anybody in here ever made a post called Throwback Thursday? Yeah. OK, you understand themes. <laughs> so what are the topics that you need to talk about? What are the ones that keep your lights on? What are the ones that pay your bills? Those go in first. But only about 20% of what you post can be a promotional or sales-based. 70% um, of what you're posting needs to be valuable, not to you, to your audience, to your customer, to your client, to your public. What's valuable to them? You're going to have to rock your brain. You're going to have to look in the past, uh, potentially ask. Pay attention to what they like and what they interact with. Um, but I'll give you an example of my themes. Uh, back to School Monday. I'm a college teacher. <laughs> back to School Monday, Tool Tuesday, Wisdom Wednesday, Throwback Thursday, Fam Friday, Silly Saturday, Safety Sunday. The purpose of the themes is that when I am sitting in the hallway, mic'd up with this little lavalier mic, and I was catching up on my emails before I came out here, I said to myself, what am I doing today or what did I do today? I know what my seven themes are. I don't post all seven days. Uh, but what are my themes? So I have a photo. I'm not entirely sure. I did put it on Instagram story, so I did tag the location. But for a longer term, I'm going to think about where that fits. And I'm going to find a story. And it'll lay on one of these days. Sometimes it's really easy. And I'll take a photo of something, and I'll say, that's back to school Monday. Easy. And when I have to make a Monday post, I open up my photo library, there it is. So it's kind of like when you sing the alphabet song to remember where W is. <laughs> got it, got it, okay. <laughs> so it's your song. It makes sure that you don't play the same note every single day. It makes sure that you have variety, and it makes sure you hit all the notes that make up your song or your symphony or your story. Um, so everywhere you go, we use themes. But 70% of it's value, 10% of it is promotional, and 10% of it is real, it's human. I have a phrase that I use, pimples, not perfection. What are your flaws? Your flaws are going to make me like you far more than how amazing, beautiful, wonderful that you are. That's what binds us together. And we find again and again, when people are vulnerable at whatever level, that they're comfortable being vulnerable, I'm pro-boundaries, find your boundaries and stick to them. But when you're vulnerable in any way, people just light up because they realize they're not alone. And if they really, really look up to you and they really respect you, their heart just kind of starts beating for you. Because there's a whole new level to your relationship. They know more about you. Figure out where your boundary is and set that line. <laughs> Please use calls to action. If you're going to use social media, you want to know what you want people to do. So in these themes, you might have buy this product, download this free ebook, walk into our store. Whatever the call to action is, it's always a verb. Jump, run, go. Sign up, register, attend, join. Know what those calls to action are and use them. Your audience actually needs to hear you say it or they get distracted and walk away. Alrighty, so I'm going to switch to defense. This is where things might get stickier. This is where maybe you're not so happy. But you've got the offense down. Has anybody in here ever Googled themselves? Yeah. It's technically called a vanity search. Isn't that funny that that word came up twice now? I didn't think about it like that. Um, but we call it a vanity search because you actually might be using Google or Bing if you've ever heard of that one, <laughs> or Yahoo. It doesn't matter what search engine you're using, but most likely you're using Google because almost everybody else is. So when we talk about search, we're really assuming the default is that we're talking about Google. This is an example of what a uh, search page, a search engine result page, or a SERP looks like. Um, and I wanted you to see, which one is my clicker? Which one is my, do I have one? Nope. Okay. Well, that's okay. I can do Vanna White. Alrighty. 
So 33% of users will only take the first search engine result. If it's your website, that's fantastic. If it's not your website, it should be your website. You are the most definitive source about you and your brand. If somebody else is sitting in that top position for your brand name, you have some work to do. 33% of people take that very first search result, and only one out of 10 people will even go to page number two. So that means you have 10 positions to work with or less. Um, right now I'm seeing mostly seven results on this page. Google, up till this point, up to the last few years, has been the dominant ad service for the internet. Only one out of 10 people will click on a Google ad. They can't articulate why, but they know if you paid to be visible on this page, that that is not content that they want. Um, I've been training people for 14 years in technology, and I watch people when they use search engines to see what they do, to see how the design affects them. It used to be a yellow box. Do you remember when it was a yellow box at the top of the screen and there were ads up there? Did you know that once we hit 50, we lose a lot of our ability to see the color yellow? That was the designation for advertising. That's why they don't do that anymore. Because the FTC went, that's not okay. You must have it clearly labeled that is an advertisement. Now, the average person can't articulate it, but they know they don't want to touch an ad. So it's great for brand impression. It's not as great for click-throughs. It also depends on your audience. So um, now we have a lot more advertising options. Facebook dominates the ad space now, but Amazon is coming up quickly from behind. All right, so the first step is you Google your own name, otherwise known as a vanity search. You cannot do this every day. You should not do it every day. It's not good for your health, and you don't get better search results. <laughs> because remember, you get more and more narrow search results, so you're just going to get the same stuff you've already seen. When my customers, my clients, come into me, they bring their own laptop, we'll both Google the same phrase and get different search results. So I recommend you use a machine you've never used before. The library is fantastic for this, or any time you have access to a machine that's not yours. Um, my kid brought home a, a, a computer from school, so I Googled something to see what it looked like, and it was different. So using a monitoring tool, Google Alerts is free. Google.com slash alerts. Put in your name, your business name, your CEO's name, your maiden name, your nom de plume, anything you want to track, even your number one, your, your competition, the industry convention you go to every year, the hot topic that everybody's talking about in your industry. Google Alerts will send you an email as it happens, great for PR disasters, and uh, uh, divorce attorneys love this tool. Um, <laughs> once a week, um, no, it's actually once a day, once a week, as it happens, those are the three versions. So just Google Alerts works well, but there's a couple other options in case you need them. This is great to hear what people are saying about you. By the way, when people talk about you, it's not always negative. That might be your first thought. A lot of the times, people are nice. So just be prepared for that and say thank you. <laughs> people ask me all the time, what should I do when somebody says something about me? Did you say thank you? Oh. <laughs> Feel free to talk right back to them. Be nice. So do you need to own every domain that they try and sell you? No. You should own your own name, your brand name, your own personal name. Kids, grandkids, this is the most important piece of digital real estate any one person or organization can own. This is your home on the internet. You want the dot com at all costs. You really, really do. Um, the rest of them don't really matter. If you have to go to a secondary one, a dot net will work. You don't need any of the fancy new ones that are dot shopping, dot sports. Um, we're not even recommending that you use those domains. The dot com. If you have a common name, play with your first name, middle name, last name. If you're a Bob Smith, that's hard. But Bob Smith the dentist? Bob Smith Lake County? Let's find a, you can find a way to get there. Um, I also use a service uh, called Namevine, namevine.com, and that will allow me to look up a brand name, especially if I'm building a new business, and see if the .com, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, Blogger, all of the channels you can think of, to see if they're available. This helps me 
help my clients name their businesses. Because the last thing you want to do is file your fictitious business name and then realize that it's a really common name that everybody else uses. All right, misspellings. I have my name misspelled three ways. Nobody can spell Carrie Rigo, and I don't blame them. Uh, but I don't want their mistake in spelling to have them go errant. So every once in a while they'll do a deal. Uh, they're about 12 bucks a year. Buy more than two years. Here's why. If you buy yourname.com, I own carryrego.com, but it's not the one on my business card. It forwards to my main website. Um, but scammers, people that like to steal and thieves and malicious actors on the internet, they buy one year for a domain because they have about three months before somebody catches on that they're a thief and then they're gone. So it's classic scam behavior to buy one year of a domain. If you're gonna purchase a domain, buy at least two years. If you have a physical location, Google the name of your business and see if your map comes up on the right-hand sidebar. As a driver, you've used this service, it's called Google Maps. As a business owner, they call it Google My Business. It changes its name every 18 months, that's okay. Google can't commit to anything. It was Google Places, it was Google Plus Business, it was Google, Google Places, Google Local, Google Maps. Now, currently, it is Google My Business. But if you were to type any of those terms in, you go to the right location. So make sure that your map is accurate. Each listing will have a little button on it that says, is this your business? Are you the manager? The wording changes a little bit. Claim the location, make sure everything's accurate, and they will send you a snail mail postcard to make sure that you are who you say you are at your physical location and not your competition who is trying to shut down your listing. If you've ever seen a Google Street View car, that's what they're doing. They are mapping the entire planet. They have mapped the entire planet, including North Korea. So they've done it. The odds are the information is not 100% accurate. Claim the location for free. This is also important because it ports into Yelp and TripAdvisor and hundreds and thousands of other websites. People don't build their own mapping services. They just lease information from Google. Um, remove and edit any listings that are inaccurate. Um, it's very common for your information to be purchased. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. Um, but you can also monitor the activity that are happening on maps. If I'm going to venture into the Voldemort area, he who shall not be named, anybody want to guess who I'm talking about? Yelp. Yelp. Don't utter the name. Don't look it in the eye. There is no way to win at Yelp. There is no way to win. The highest court in California determined that it is not extortion because nobody in their right mind would think that Yelp was being helpful. <laughs> so it has been ruled that it is not technically extortion, but all of the behavior that Yelp engages in is textbook extortion. Here's my answer to get them when they, when they call you, to get them to leave you alone. Wow, thanks for calling, be nice promise it's worth it. Wow, thanks for calling. Um, would you like to buy an ad? And then you say, oh, I'm really busy. Actually, I wouldn't even know what to do with all that new business. And then they stutter, and then they spin around backwards in a circle, and they don't know what to do with themselves. It's not on their script. <laughs> they don't know how to respond to that. And then they go, but really? I have, and the first time I said it, the, you know, when I discovered this, it was true. I really couldn't handle any, any more new business if I were to advertise. And I realized that's the answer. It's not on their script anywhere because nobody ever says that. So I give you my answer to Yelp. It works. And then they put you on the do not call for six months until that person leaves the business and a new person comes in. Okay. So you can, mm, I would back away from Yelp. Uh, Google has a fantastic review system because they don't make money off of it. And they're much more likely to help you if there's a false or fraudulent review. You have a lot more recourse as a business owner with Google than you do with he who shall not be named. All right. <laughs> and respond to reviews, good and bad. So if you've ever Googled your own name, I found one yesterday that said, we have found Carrie Rigo. View her cell phone number and house address. I've also seen ones that say, has Carrie Rigo been arrested? Yeah. <laughs> 
with a question mark. So it's not a claim. It's designed to scare the pants off of me. So if you see a listing like this and you click on it, hoping to learn what they have on you, it's purchased public aggregate data that is currently legal for people to purchase in large batches. So think of this like weeding. Every time you Google your name, you're gonna find your personal information. These services, there's on the left-hand side, just a sampling of some of the services you might find. They're gonna charge, oh, don't worry, $3.95? And you are the one that's most likely to pay for it because you're scared and you're nervous. What's out there? It's public data. Um, so you're the one that's gonna pay $3.95 to learn that they have a really old phone number and nobody cares. That's their business model. Legally, they have to allow you a way out, but they don't have to make it easy to find. So whatever you find, rather than dig around on their website looking for the delete my listing, I want you to Google the name of the service you find and then add a phrase, opt out, claim my listing, delete my listing, any variation that you want. I did an example of one that I've used on a regular basis. And Google will find the opt out page for you. Spokio is going to hide it, deeply hide it in their website. They don't have to make it easy. You're going to do this every single time you audit and look up your own name. And sometimes I have to delete over and over and over again because that company continues to buy data from your driver's license, your voter registration, your mortgage, your tax records, your utility bills. Depending on the state that you live in, some of those are not available like voter registration, but the rest of them are. And it's going to keep happening. So for the rest of your life, it is your job to make sure that you are protected in this most minimal way. This is nobody else's responsibility, unfortunately, except yours. Um, that's the way it's set up. That's what we're working with. So expect this continuing to monitor your own name and to make sure that the example of what's out there is clean and clear and what people find is accurate. All right, the final piece though in this defense is proactive placement. So we've checked our name, we've cleaned up stuff, we have a monitoring system, um, we're responding to reviews, making sure those maps are okay. This is the last piece, it's like a hook around. The content that you put out on social media is the most important content about you. Any content that you put out about yourself personally or your brand is the most definitive content about you. You're the most respected topic or you're the most respected author about that particular topic. So whether you're using your Facebook page, your Twitter account, um, any blog, that one happens to be Blogger, there's a WordPress in the upper right hand corner, Pinterest, Vimeo, um, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, these tools are all free. And they fill in that first page of Google because Google recognizes how important they are for providing fresh, up-to-date information that the users want, that they click on on the very first page of Google. The trick is you can't just open the accounts. You have to open them and then use them frequently, consistency, um, with a plan, with a great voice. You have to use all those pieces on a regular basis. And then these tools fill in the front couple pages of Google for you. It takes a little bit of effort, but you're the one with the story about your brand. You're the only person that can tell the accurate story. And the responsibility is on you. Whether it's what we look like here, whether it's the people that are here together, whether it's what we build, it's what we make, it's how we feel, it's who we are, you have to tell other people. We have to see it, particularly young people. If you want them to stay, if you want them to come back, you have to tell them why it's amazing to be here. They have to see it. They won't believe it, ever, until you tell them the story. So that proactive placement, last piece of information I want to share with you. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, said at a Technomi conference, I think it was 2008, so the numbers are old, but they are still shocking. Every 48 hours, we create more data than all of human history up until 2003. Every two days, it's a fresh blanket of snow out there. 
Now, if you don't um, have proactive placement of content, somebody else is going to leave tracks in your name. Stuff does sink to the bottom in like in a snowpack, but every two days, you get a fresh crack at it. If you choose to stay in the house, great, but nobody's going to find you. Put your snowshoes on and get out there. But I want to say thank you very much. Let me give you the link for the site. It's a bit.ly link, bit.ly, lake, C-O, S-M-B, branding. I won't try and read the whole thing. But I wanted to say thank you so much for your attentive listening. And I look forward very much to seeing the patterns that you leave in the snow. Woo!